Welcome to Real Wealth, Real Health, the show that empowers you with insights, information, and inspiration to achieve your version of financial wellness. Learn how to balance living a full life today with planning for the future. This podcast is brought to you by Alpha Investing, a real estate-centric private capital network that provides exclusive investment opportunities to its members. And now, here are your hosts, Ada Pia Dorico and Daniel Coca. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Real Wealth, Real Health. Today, we're speaking with Bonnie Koo, CEO and founder of Wealthy Mom MD. After working for Morgan Stanley, Bonnie decided to attend medical school and become a dermatologist. However, during this time, she never lost her passion for finances and money management and often found herself as the go to person in her network for all things finance and money related. And as her financial foundations became more stable while she was practicing medicine, she further developed her knowledge base around financial planning, which led her to creating her entrepreneurial online business, Wealthy Mom MD. Bonnie has now pared back her medical practice to focus more on helping other women physicians understand the modern financial system and achieve their own visions of financial independence. In addition to discussing her own career and experience as an entrepreneur, we talk about life coaching, her approach and philosophy towards building wealth, and we really dive into the role of coaching and the role of mindset and what it means to play with this idea of what financial success and independence means for every single person individually, and then taking action on those goals and dreams. This episode will surely inspire you if you are looking to have more financial independence and you have maybe some barriers in your mind that have stopped you thus far. Bonnie, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Thanks so much for having me. Yes. I was taking a look at your website, which you've totally revamped i know recently and there's a couple things that really stood out to me that you that you said one of them is you asked the question is it possible for a physician mom to truly have it all without giving her all and then that your mission is to empower women physicians to build wealth and create the life that they want because financial freedom enables you to create the life that you love and we could not agree more so how did you get to where you are today starting, I know you had a stint, you worked at Morgan Stanley at some point in your life, and then you became a dermatologist. And now you're putting that all together to help other women achieve financial independence. Yeah. You're talking about the wealthy mom and D business, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, It's so funny. Like I didn't wake up one day thinking I need to start a business because I was pretty happy being a dermatologist and, you know, dermatologists generally aren't looking for a side gig to make extra money, right? So that's kind of where I was. I wasn't thinking. I was literally just, it's funny because now people ask me all the time, you know, how do I find out what I want to do? And this is what I tell them. And this will sort of answer the question. I was like, well, what is the thing or topic that if it comes up or if you see like a Facebook post on that topic, you just can't help but like comment and chime in. Mm-hmm. You know, you just love that topic so much. You just can't help but talk about it or help people or answer people's questions. Right. And it's funny because you know, if you asked me 10 years ago, if I would be doing anything related to money, I, I, I'd probably just laugh at you because I was a disaster when it came to money, oh. you know, about 10 years, and which isn't that long ago, if you think about it. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it, money just kind of came to me my last year of residency, I just started learning about it because two of my co-residents were talking about money and they were talking, they talked about it all the time, but I think maybe because I was looking for jobs and now I was kind of forced to like deal with it. That's when I was just sort of doing my own research and they said, oh, you should you know, read this book. So I bought the book. And then, then I'm one of those people that once I get into a topic, I just kind of like go nuts and like become a sponge. And, you know, in this day and age, it's so easy to find information. You just, you know, spend time Googling stuff, but like you can find so much at your fingertips. So that's kind of what I did. And then I just really enjoyed it. It made sense to me. You know, initially I was just more into financial logistics, like how do these retirement accounts work? Because that's kind of what I was working on because I was looking at my job contract, evaluating their 
benefits. So it was an opportunity for me to kind of dive in to see what are these 401ks? Why is it called a 401k? Sure. You know, all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of how it started. And then it became that thing where when the topic came up, I would talk about it. Right. And then, and then in terms of like, when did I actually monetize it? That came much later, like maybe at least a year or two after that even started. And basically a girlfriend was like, you should start a blog. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely was not on my radar. So that started, oh gosh, that blog was 2017 at this point when I started right. it. Right. Yeah. Famous last words, right? When somebody tells you that and, and, and you look at them and say, no, what are you talking about? But yeah, here you are because you've, you've been through a different iteration of your website. It was Miss Bonnie MD, right? And then yep. it became Wealthy Mom MD. And it's so beautifully branded. It like really speaks to, to who you are. And I've had, you know, the opportunity to get to know you over the last couple of years. And your story is really inspirational, you know, because you, you, you're so honest and you're so open and transparent about things. Things. Like you said, just right now, you said I was a disaster financially. And so often when we think about, let's say, any kind of financial expert or, you know, anybody in finance to any degree, there's this idea that they should know everything and be perfect and never get anything wrong. But, you know, that can always lead to also things like hiding the things that you've got wrong. And how could you possibly help somebody if you're not sharing what you got wrong? Oh, yeah. I mean, I still make I still make mistakes. I'm an overspender by nature, just, to, just for an example. <laughs> and I racked up like $20,000 of credit card debt during residency. I was buying clothes and shoes. <laughs> right, so. right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're not taught any of this in school. Like we, you know, we have to choose to, to learn about financial planning. Like I chose really young. I started when I was 18. I remember my I think it was my, my keyboarding teacher. This is how far back things go when we had a class to learn how to type on a computer. And he was talking about mutual funds like this back in like 96. And I was really intrigued by, by this. And then that kind of led me over the years to kind of get into understanding like how do mutual funds work and how does this, you know, how do you become financially independent? Because I'm sure the same way you um, understood this too, is like it allows you to do so much more when you understand how to manage your money and it's not about making the most money possible or being filthy rich. It's just about giving yourself enough to do what you want to do and be comfortable. Yeah. I mean, money is a tool. It's a great, powerful tool. And if you have enough of it, then you won't, you know, have to stay in a situation you don't want to like a job or, you know, even like you know, let's say a relationship, for example. I think a lot of women feel trapped because they feel like they can't leave because of money, for example. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of stories about that, actually, which would be like a whole rabbit hole that I don't want to go, I don't want to go down because there's, there's just so much, there's so much there. But like, let's talk really quickly, you know, as you've come through the past few years, you've really come into being an entrepreneur as a blogger. You're a dermatologist. Do you still have your dermatology practice? So my, it's interesting you ask because my medicine career has gone through several iterations. I mean, I'm five years out of residency at this point. So still early, you know, in terms of like, you know, my medical career, because I went to med school when I was 27. So it was a second career for me. So I started out in academics, then prior practice, and I switched to locums, which is like temporary work. Okay. That's how I was able to live in Hawaii for three months over the winter, if you, if you remember. <laughs> yep. <laughs> And now I do teledermatology, so exclusively seeing patients online, but I don't do virtual visits on Zoom. It's all, they upload photos and then I submit a very thorough report. I mean, sometimes I will have to Zoom with them if I'm starting them on certain medications that that's just required for billing. Yeah. But it's a, it's such a, I actually love this app. It's a job I'd lined up before the pandemic, but obviously it's perfect with the pandemic, you know, going on right now. So, Cause I don't have to, you know, physically see anyone. The patient doesn't have to take time off from work and like yeah. go somewhere and put themselves at risk. I can't do everything. If, if someone submits a visit and I can't do it, like, you know, legitly like a mole check, I can't do that. Right. And I just, you know, I just decline the visit and they don't get charged. So mm -hmm. that's what I do now. I do that maybe five hours a week. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So you've kind of taken the four hour work week approach to your dermatology <laughs> practice. Um, I love that. Um, it, it
you're, you're just like a, like a multi-pronged entrepreneur. And, you know, as you know, we're entrepreneurs as well. And we always love speaking to other entrepreneurs about, you know, about their journeys. And before we dive into like more of like the, the meat and potatoes investing and, and real estate, if you're, if you'd like to share maybe what some of your biggest challenges have been as an entrepreneur, uh, and maybe also like a recent success and by entrepreneur at this stage, I'm talking about with your blog and, and with starting this, this business business around helping women achieve financial independence. So you said biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest challenge that I'm undergoing right now actually is, is growing, you know, in the big, it's like, there's different challenges at every stage, right? When you're just getting started, you're just trying to like make money. That's like a whole different challenge. And then there's like, when you start making money, which is sort of where I'm at. And then it's like, okay, how do you scale and how do you grow this business that so that I'm not the one hustling 24 seven on the business. So I'm in this phase where I'm learning how to manage people and learning how to create and implement systems and processes. So I actually love it. It's really fun for me. And I think, and I think I even read it in Rich Dad Poor Dad. I think Robert Kiyosaki even said like, this is like a skill set you need to learn if you want to become wealthy. So you have to learn how to create and implement processes and manage people. And that is a skill that you don't learn in regular school. Maybe you learn in business school, but I didn't go to business school. And so that's been really eye-opening to me, like learning how to do that part of business. Yeah, I think that's always something that, you know, particularly when I was working as a lawyer, there was always this assumption that, you know, as you get more senior and, and people start working underneath you, that you just kind of understand like how to delegate, how to motivate. And there was never really a ton of like, mentoring or education or training around how to do it. You just kind of had to, to figure it out, right? And so, you know, now in this environment where, you know, we're all kind of more entrepreneurial here, the importance of that is, is just beyond, you know, my, was beyond my scope at that time. And so it's a really interesting process. It's also to hear, you know, how, how well you're doing and how, you know, much you've grown. It's really a testament to, Kind of what's out there in in the marketplace and just kind of the desire for you know the folks in, in your network to you know kind of get that coaching and mentoring and, and leadership which is great and you know one of the reasons that you know i think we connected with you from the beginning i would love to hear just a bit more about kind of what's what's happening on on that front you know what things are you kind of looking at you know, on the investment side, you know, financial management side, like where are your, where's your future growth headed in, in that, in that respect? Awesome question. So it's interesting. Like I'm still, I still feel like I'm still learning when it comes to money. And so it's funny, like when I first started learning about money as a resident, so we're talking like six years ago at this point, you know, all I knew was index funds, do index funds. This is how you do index funds, compound interest, plug it into a thing and this is this is the thing you need to reach for and then that's it. So that was like sort of like money 101 for me. And so that's where I started and I was like, okay, that makes sense. I, I fill up my 401k bucket. I should do a Roth IRA. And it felt kind of like neat for when I've made my first like, you know, purchase of index fund. It was like scary. You know, now I'm like, whatever. I just said it and forget it now for that. And then it wasn't honestly until a year or two, two years ago. I actually I actually looked up when I invested in my first syndication. And that I was like, okay, now it's time to like go to like money 201. Like what's next? Because obviously index funds aren't the only way. And then my thought process and just knowledge of money has changed over time because now I just, I like the idea of having multiple legs of income. Like if you think of wealth as a table, the goal is to have as many legs as possible so that when one leg falls, because the stock market inevitably goes down, right? Because it goes up and down, just the nature of it. I'm not going to be out of luck or even if I lose my job, right, which is happening now in the pandemic with lots of people. So if I lose my job, which is unfortunately most people's only source of money, the table's not going to fall down. So right now I'm learning about how to build as many legs as possible. And even within my business, I'm learning how to create different revenue streams within my business so I'm not dependent on just one product. And so I started investing in real estate. This is you know for personal finances a few years ago, starting with uh, a syndication and we just bought our first rental property. Did you buy that rental property yourselves or did you go into um, a syndication with, with others? Like what kind of rental did you buy? Yeah. So it was a single, like what was the terminology? Single family home. <laughs> 
And, but it's two doors on one property. So it's like a main house, but they have like a little in-law thing in the back. Yep. I say thing because I actually haven't seen the property with my own eyes. Sure. That's why it sounds so funny. And so that's funny. It's another thing is you don't have to see the place with your own eyes to buy a property. So we, you know, we, we actually met this investor agent last summer. So when I switched to locums, my first stint was in Seattle. And so when we lived in Seattle, we had some physician friends who are very active in real estate who lived in the Seattle area. And so they introduced us to investor agents. And as you know, real estate's all about relationships. And so at the time we weren't ready, but I was working, but Matt was able to spend a day with them and just look at some properties together and just meet them. And, but we didn't actually buy anything until a few months ago, but it was with those same people. And because we had met them and trust, or he trusted them because I, hadn't, I actually hadn't met them. That's kind of how that started. So we just closed a month and a half ago on that. Oh, okay, great. Well, I hope you got some good pricing, some good COVID pricing on, uh, on that property. I don't know if it was COVID pricing, but we didn't overpay, you know, in terms of we got what we wanted, maybe 5,000 less. And we're, we're going to do a lot of work on it to kind of, we're going to add an extra bedroom to it, actually. Not like add it, but it's just laid out so that it's amenable to just, you know, shifting a door and then we can make an extra bedroom, which will obviously increase its value. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. There's so many strategies, obviously, that, that we know about when it comes to, to real estate. I just want to dig into this just a little bit more because we personally here, my husband and I, we converted our garage um, into an ADU, so accessory dwelling unit, which is what you're talking about. And we short term rent it on Airbnb. And so that's also been like when you talk about other sources of of income just to start to build and also this idea of building doors and having different, you know, revenue streams. It's not a ton of money because it's, um, you know, it's a small unit, but it certainly gave us a much different approach to thinking about how do you maximize what you've got to make some money. And I think real estate's for me, one of the, the most interesting ways to do that. So like you said, like there's strategies, like there's a value add strategy, which is very similar to what our sponsors do, except on much larger buildings, as you know, but they're buying a property, not overpaying for it, hopefully paying under market, fixing it up, raising rents, et cetera, et cetera, and, and selling it later for, for more. So it is, it is pretty normal for people to start with that single family home and then and then move up into like buying multifamilies. And I wanted to ask you, when you invested in your first syndication, what kind of syndication was that in terms of, was it a multifamily asset? Was it like self-storage? Like what, and what were some of the criteria that you looked at to help you make that decision? So it was a multifamily. So I really didn't know much about real estate at all back then. And so I literally asked a friend I trusted, I need to invest and I want to invest this much. Tell me who to invest with. And he gave me a list. I was like, no, no, I don't want a list. Just tell me who. Because <laughs> I just didn't want to have to. I think a lot of, at least this is my personal experience, I think a barrier to getting started is it's overwhelming, the options out there. And so I just was like, just tell me who to invest with. Tell me why, but I just want like one choice. I think he actually gave me a few, but I was like, okay, just but tell me which one I should do. And I, I kind of was pitting a lot on him because I just was overwhelmed with, too, there's just too many offerings out there. And so that's sort of how I got introduced. And then it ended up being a multifamily building. And it was actually not too far away from where I physically lived. That wasn't why I did it, but it was kind of neat to know that, oh, I actually know where that place is. And I knew a little bit. So that was kind of neat for me. You know, one of the things that we notice whenever we talk to you know, potential new members of our, our network is that you know, particularly as, as people are trying to maybe get into real estate for the, the first time, it's always this question of, you know, do I want to be a passive investor or do I want to go out and like actually buy something, own it directly, you know, be responsible for kind of what happens. And I think with a lot of what I'll call, you know, the working professionals, whether they're doctors, lawyers, business people, what have you, a lot of people end up on the, I've got a job, um, that's my core competency. I spend a lot of time there. I want to invest, but I just don't have the time to get into it actively. I'd be really interested just to hear, you know, kind of your thought process there, because similarly, you know, you started out making passive investments with someone you trusted and then, you know, eventually moved into, you know, more of an active investor role. I'd be interested just to hear about, you know, your thought progression there. Yeah. So definitely in terms of why I started 
passively was just like you said, I, I was busy. I didn't know anything about real estate and passive sounds easier, basically, right? Less time. I still had to, you know, put money into it, but it didn't require much, you know, effort or time except for picking it and then, you know, setting it up so that the money transferred over type of thing. And so that's, and then I did that and then I invested in a, you know, second syndication. And then in terms of the active stuff, that wasn't really on my radar. Like, it's funny because even though you start passively, the you know the, the language is the same. If you're learning about passive real estate, you're still learning about real estate. And at some point, I realized I actually understood what the words mean. I know it sounds funny, but like I think I was just passively reading things. Like I was, I'm in a lot of real estate Facebook groups. I don't comment because it's not my superpower. But I guess I was reading it. It's like a, it was just like osmosis. Like I literally one day I woke up and I was like, oh, I know what that word means. And I didn't know what that word meant a year ago. And then I have a few friends who are really into active real estate and they've literally been bugging me for a long time. Not like in a, you know, annoying way, but I think it was more like, but this is such a better way or you can, you just have so much more control and you could, you know, make money fast, you know, just all these tax, tax benefits with active real estate. And I slowly learned over time, sort of the pros of that and the cons too, obviously. And I think, like I said earlier, I wanted to create another stream of income. It is something you have more control over, which is either scary or inspiring depending on the person, right? And I think if you're an entrepreneur, active real estate kind of, the skill set's the same. There's a thing you have to be creative and willing to take, you know, risk and do things. And then also, you know, I feel lucky in that I was willing, I had a partner who was interested in real estate, had some personal experience as a homeowner, not so much as owning rental real estate. And he was interested in sort of taking the lead on the active side. So obviously we made the purchase together in terms of like deciding this was the right place for us, but he's taking the lead on doing a lot of the legwork because I already have a business that I have to give time to and active real estate is not a, you know, you can do on the side depending on how much control you want or not, which I, which I think is also another misconception that direct real estate has to be so active. It can be really hands off if you want it to be. So that's what I've learned. There's so many different ways. And I, I think that's what I really like about it is there's kind of something for everyone but I can see how that can be overwhelming for a first timer. Yeah, there's, I think like, like anything, right. When, when you start, you don't know the jargon, you, like you don't know the words, it, even, you know, even for me, like I have a background in, in financial planning and it took me a while to understand commercial real estate, like with all the, all the different acronyms, all the different ways that you can calculate returns and, you know, all the things that go into it. And so I think it's really important to also be compassionate with ourselves, right? Because like, if we're like strong A types, like we, we want to know everything. We want to know it right away. We don't want to be wrong. You know, we want to get it right, but it's fair. I think it's really fair. And I think you said it really well, like it's complicated, but it can be as complicated as you want it to be. You can be as hands-on or hands-off as you want to be. Like in your case, it's great that you have a partner to help. I think if people have that with, with their partner, I think that's a really great way to to be able to like expand in ways where, where you guys are doing it together instead of like, oh, I have my career and then I have my career and we just combine incomes and then that's it. So I really love that. It's the same. I have the same with my husband. So I really like, I really appreciate that. And so. Do you, do you think about it, Bonnie, as a fun project or do you think about it more as a financial investment? You know, obviously it's a combination of each, but you know, just, just curious your approach. Oh, and you know what? It's interesting. I think if you just said, is it just financial? I'd say, well, we're investing in real estate for financial reasons, but it also has the added benefit of being a project and, you know, kind of like an entrepreneurial project in that regard, right? Because for example, we, we're just, we just got quotes for the renovation we want to do and just kind of going back and forth and deciding if we're going to accept the whole, you know, pro forma or not, that sort of thing. So it's, I'm not super involved, but I like to review all the big financial decisions because it's a, you know, I think it's a $60,000, you know, renovation. And so it's been, it's been more fun than I thought. It's funny because a year ago when my friends were saying, hey, you know, you really should start looking to direct real estate. And I was like, you know, with, you know, <laughs> basically putting up a cross, like, ah, I don't think so. That's not for me. And also, and this kind of goes into like, you know, me as a coach, I literally believed we didn't have the money to invest in it. And so that sounds like a fact, right? Like if I told you, oh, we don't have money to invest in real estate, most people would be like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But like, 
that wasn't true, but I thought it was true, which, which kind of blows my mind because I'm a coach, so I feel like I should have recognized that. But that's the thing with human brains is no matter how evolved you are, how much coaching you get, your brain still has brain farts literally about things like that. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's a, God, God, sorry. No, no, you go ahead, Dan. I was gonna say, it's, it's really interesting because I've always kind of felt the same way. And as someone who like, lived in New York City, you know, basically my entire professional life, this idea of like even buying a home, like seemed so distant to me, like, oh, I need to have you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars saved up and that's the only way I can do it. And then once you actually start getting into the process and you spend some time, you know, learning, you realize, oh, like, that's not actually the case, right? And I think that parallels, at least in my experience, a lot of the way people approach real estate investing. You know, there are obviously a, a lot of complicated and complex components to any real estate transaction, but you know, you'd be amazed spending a few hours, you know, a week for a couple months, you know, reading through different materials, you know, how kind of far along in the process you can get. And I imagine, Bonnie, you know, your story is very similar. Yeah. So I, it's so interesting, like, cause I, I remember a year ago, I'm like, yeah, we don't have money for that. Maybe next year we will. And it's like something flipped. And I don't exa- I don't know exactly the moment, but at some point I was like, okay, we're ready to do this. And it's it's so funny. As soon as you like sort of make that decision and commitment that you're gonna do it, like you just you just find a way because we had a lot of roadblocks even buying this first property in terms of getting a loan. So we actually have to pay cash for it, which you know isn't ideal, but I wasn't gonna let you know, not getting a loan at this point, you know, I, it, I totally could have been like, oh, well, we can't get a loan, so we're not going to do it. And I think a year ago, that would have been me. But I think I was like, well, I, you know, just kept looking and figuring out where we could get the money from. I love that. I just wanted to touch on on what you were saying here about what you believe, which inherently is like so much about what we believe in ourselves. And maybe sometimes it comes down to like self-worth. And so I would love to sort of spend a little bit of time talking about coaching and how that's helped you. And it obviously helped you so much that you became so passionate about it that you became a coach. So I really want to talk about that because I think there's a lot of misconceptions. I know I've had a lot of misconceptions about coaches and and coaching. And so, you know, can you like enlighten us a little bit on your journey of working with a coach and how that shaped uh, a decision to become a coach? Yeah, absolutely. I love talking about coaching. So just just a brief background. So I am someone who's always been a self-help junkie. (laughs) So I did all this stuff in my early 20s. So way before medical school. And then I rediscovered coaching because I literally saw a Facebook post, a woman physician was offering coaching because she needed to basically have clients as part of her training, right? Kind of makes sense, right? Just you have to see patients to become a doctor. So so she was doing like her training basically. And I knew the value of coaching because of my self-help junkie days, like in terms of what it costs, because I think I was looking into hiring a life coach in my twenties, but it was too expensive, you know, for someone at that stage of like for me. And so when she said free coaching, I literally was like, I don't know this person, but sign me up. And that was two years ago at this point, I think is when I signed up with her. And so I guess the reason why I decided to become one was because the more I learned about it, and it's funny because you would think I would know more, but it's like working out, right? Like you work out, you build some muscle, but you have to keep lifting weights to keep that physique, right? And that's the same thing with self-help. Co- and coaching. So if people, coaching is different things, different people. The type of coaching I am trained in is also called thought work. And so it's really just learning how the human brain works. And basically like I teach my clients things about themselves. Like it's, it's kind of like money. Like it, this needs to be taught in school. Like it's crazy to me that it's not. And so, so the basis of the coaching I've learned is basically that your thoughts, which are beliefs, create your feelings, your feelings, create your actions, your actions, create your results. And so literally what I tell people is you create money with your thoughts because it's true. And when I say that, people are like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, anything you see out there, the microphones we're learn- using right now to podcast was initially someone's thought slash idea, right? Thoughts, beliefs, that they're all the same thing. So someone created, thought of something, and now we have a microphone. Someone thought of a TV and now we all have TVs. And so that's the same thing with money, right? We create, you know, value with our thoughts. So 
once I sort of saw that connection, I was like, well, I have to be a coach because that's, I just saw that as taking things to the next level and my ability to really teach and help people around money is because so many people have all these, you know, limiting beliefs about money because we grow up with all this, you know, BS about money, what it, you know, that we shouldn't want money. It's like bad to want money. We don't want to be that rich, greedy person. So if you think about it, even like in movies, all the villains are like rich. <laughs> right. Noticed? Or they want all the money in the world to destroy everybody. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so you we kind of have to unpack a lot of stuff we've absorbed since we were kids. And so that's why I love coaching. So I coach specifically on money and I also coach on business too. And, you know, this, this applies to any sort of area of life. So I have a life coach, I have a business coach, and it's something I'll always invest in because I just feel like, you know, you with money, if you want to create a lot of wealth, and it's not, that's not everyone's goal, obviously, you really have to take your mind to the next level to create that kind of money. Yeah. And so I feel like I need to be, not like I feel like, but it, for me, it's like, I'm just curious as to what I can create in the world. Mm -hmm. And sort of as an example to show people that it's possible to do that. And, and my mentor, Brooke Castillo of the Life Coach School, like she talks about money openly and she freaks a lot of people out about money because she's so open about it. But you, it's one of those things that you have to start talking about. Like, it's kind of interesting. Like, you know, the last time we sat around with friends, like who, who knows what that was at this point, like you don't go around exchanging each other's net worths, right? It's just not something you talk about. But it's so interesting. Like everyone wants more money, I think, mm -hmm. whether they say it or not, but like, I think that's true. Yeah. And, but no one wants to talk about, talk about it. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. There's, it always comes down to what conditioning or like essentially like programming that we learn from a young age. I do like you, I do a lot of personal development work and I'm not a coach, but I am a facilitator in Psych K, which is a subconscious reprogramming modality, which is really, really interesting when it comes down to making like permanent rewiring changes like inside your beliefs. So mm -hmm. really understanding how to change it and emotions play such a huge role because they're magnetic, right? Like an emotion will magnetize what you're creating with your thoughts like a thought is electric and emotion is magnetic so it just has that electromagnetic kind of you know it's a frequency but anyways it it, it has that function so i love hearing you you talk about that because it's it's very it's very much what i understand as well and it's really hard sometimes to do that for ourselves and so having somebody alongside like you're like you're saying the analogy of exercising it's the same thing with having you know, potentially like a trainer or a coach on the fitness side where you can essentially hold up a mirror to yourself yep. around, especially what you believe you can't lift or how far you can run, or like you're saying how much money you can make. And so I would love to ask you just in your experience, what are some of the primary limiting beliefs that people that that people have essentially like whether, I mean, you work mostly with men, women and I know we have a different set of them. So maybe let's focus on those. Like what are some of the key core limiting beliefs that are holding us back? Yeah, that's such a good question. Well, first I want to say that I love what you said about reprogramming beliefs. That's basically what I do as a coach. Like that's my job is to help people reprogram, like download new software into their brain. Yes. And then people don't realize that they can download new software. And it, it's like, it's just awesome to see that people do that. Anyway, core limiting beliefs. Oh, I think the big, I think honestly, it's kind of like the main thing I see is people just don't think it's possible for them to have money or for them to have like money freedom. What are, and it's not even like a number, like they want $5 million, but like, it's like, they're so used to money being hard for them. They can't see another way, even though they want money to not be hard for them. Yeah. They can't like, it's, it's, and it's also so comfortable for them. And so that's another thing, you know, with thought work is our brains love to be efficient. So even if you're replaying a belief that's clearly not helping your bank account, it doesn't matter that it's not helping your bank account. Your brain is like, well, this is like, we've been playing this for decades. So we're just going to keep playing this belief because it's just right. easy and we don't have to spend any energy because to download new software literally requires a lot of energy and effort to reprogram. Yeah. And a lot of people, well, just, you know, just, you know, primitive brain doesn't want to deal with, doesn't want to deal with anything like that, basically. Totally. Yeah. And so, and then also with money is even though I'm not sure this is so much a core limiting belief, but what I see a lot is people like the idea of wealth, whatever that means to them. Mm 
Because mm-hmm. I don't say like, oh, wealth means you've attained this you know, net worth. People are afraid of what other people are going to think of them if they have more money. So I see that a lot. Oh, They're wow. worried about what people are going to say about them. Because I think at the core, one of the core human desires is to be accepted by the pack, right? Yeah. yeah. And if you're suddenly like the rich person, people sometimes don't like that. Yeah. And so yeah, I see no. that a lot of fear of, you know, going against the grain. And so I literally tell people inside my course, you need to find some people who love money. <laughs> find, I'm ser- and that's yeah. like, and, and have money because people yeah. who have money and love money, they love talk th- and also beliefs are contagious. So you have to hang out with people who have the beliefs that you want because it just helps you download that new software. And so I say that a lot. And then I think there's just this thing that people believe like, oh, actually I was asking my stepson this over the weekend. I was doing a little teaching. I was like, oh no, not my stepson, my, my niece, or was it my nephew? One of them. We were just visiting them recently. I was like, how, where does money come from? I just asked him because I was just, you know, he's in fourth grade, right? I'm like, where does money come from? And he was like, oh, it comes from like that machine, that prints paper. I'm like, no, no, I don't mean literal money. <laughs> Oh, wow. I was, like, I was like, where does money come from? He's like, oh, he's like, well, if you have rich parents. And I was like, well, if that's the only way to get money. Like, that's awful because that means I'm never going to be rich. You know, I was kind of, you know, joking right. with him a little bit. And I was like, is that the only way you can have a lot of money? And we were just having this conversation. But there's all these misconceptions that you have to be born into the right family. You know, it's it's like if you're not like Bill Gates daughters and sons are never going to be rich. Like that is, there's definitely a lot of that going around. And so it's like, they see themselves as someone who's never going to become rich. Just like um, if someone is overweight, they can't see themselves as like a thin person. I think it's kind of a very similar analogy there. Yeah. They just can't see themselves as someone who has a lot of money. So. Yeah. Yeah. That, that one's, I don't have kids and I don't surround myself with them, but I always think how, how much they speak truth because they have no filters and there's so much, there's so much in there and there's so much to learn. And I do recognize some of, some of those in myself too, like this idea that having, you know, having more means having too much means I, you know, I think I'm better than where I came from. You know, my parents are immigrants and we were never rich. We were often like, you know, not really having great Christmases kind of a thing. And and so it's really this, this idea that like I can get what I need to get and achieve what I want to achieve. But at the same time, you know, what will they, what will others think of me if I do, you know, achieve a certain, a certain thing. And I, I did some work on this on myself and I realized that a lot of it came down to an observation of jealousy in my parents and, you know, specifically my dad where he would speak badly of people with money. Uh, And it was, you know, it's jealousy that comes out because it's envy. And so I recognized that and it kind of had this cross effect with me where I internalized that to be, well, if I have more then my dad will say those things about me. And it goes back to what you said about acceptance and, and love. So they're, they're all really great insights. And we just have to sort of do that, that work on ourselves to have that reflection and see where it is so that we can say, wait a minute, that's silly. I know my dad loves me. He's excited when I do well. So I, I can just, you know, put that program in the trash and hit empty, you know? Yeah. I like that analogy, hit empty. I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> like permanently delete that stuff, you know, that stuff's got to go. Dan, did you have anything you wanted to add to that before we kind of wrap up? No, I don't think so specifically. I mean, listen, I could get into hour long conversation about inherited wealth if we wanted to, which I think is a really interesting topic and something that, you know, given where we are in like, America today is going to have, you know, an outsized impact on, on things. And, mm. you know, we were talking about this the other day at a, a higher level on a PS, just, you know, you know, I grew up in a very, you know, middle-class family as well, like first person to go to college in my family. And, you know, I was surrounded by, you know, a socioeconomic class of people that were very similar to my family. And then, you know, as I went to law school and then started working at this big law firm in New York City, 
you know, all of a sudden, like I'm surrounded by this group of, you know, relatively wealthy people. And, you know, the, the impact of inherited wealth on, you know, someone in that position or, or you know, the, my friends and colleagues, it's really interesting just to think about how quickly you're able to kind of move your life forward, the risks that you're able to take, you know, that you can't when you have to worry about paying your student loans off or, you know, you're renting instead of owning. And so you're trying to save up for a down payment on a home, things like that. And so I read a really interesting quote, maybe last night, I've been rereading uh, Liar's Poker, which is something I read in college when I thought I wanted to be an investment banker. But there was a really interesting question about or, or comment around, you know, banker bonuses and that, you know, no one actually feels wealthy they just get to varying degrees uh, of feeling poor, relative degrees of poverty, as they increase their wealth, move into you know different social classes, and then ultimately realize I'm not as wealthy as the people around me, and then that leads you back to that you know initial thinking of well I actually don't have that much, and so I know I said I didn't have anything to say on this topic, but I guess I do, and yeah, just an observation which I think is consistent with what the both of you have been, been chatting about. I could also talk a lot more about inherited wealth. And it's, it's interesting. It's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Like, do they have money? Be, do they have money and think money is easy because they have the money? Or are they born into wealth because their families believe money is easy and they have the wealth, right? So I always find that kind of interesting because people with money, they think very differently about money than people who've struggled with money. So it's, I find that fascinating. Yeah, there's, a, there's so much psychology in this. It's probably one of the reasons why we struggle the most with money and with, with building wealth because it's so foundationally tied into our beliefs about our own value and our own worth. And Dan, when you were speaking, it kind of made me think that, you know, anytime we're comparing ourselves, it's a zero sum game. Like we will never win that comparison game no matter what. So I'm always really cognizant of that. And it's easy to spin into that and, and be able to discern, Bonnie, like what we were saying before, you, who you surround yourself with and what their beliefs are. And, you know, in the context of what we're talking about here, obviously, you know, what they believe about wealth and their ability to live a good life. And so you know, to wrap up, I would love to ask you, you know, what do you think about building wealth and what does wealth specifically mean to you? Yeah, so what is wealth? So one of the reasons why I chose the word wealthy in my brand name is because obviously it is a money word, but I also feel like it represents, you know, much more. And I think when I was looking at definitions of wealth, you know, obviously the first definition is always like about a money thing, but then I think it also just means to me at least, you know, wealthy in other all areas of your life. So being wealthy or rich in your relationships and love, you know, money, like having that sort of like ideal life. So that's that's to me what wealthy means. And money is clearly a component of it, but it's not everything, right? Because you can be rich and unhappy. And you can be rich and happy. I'd rather be rich and I want to be rich and happy. <laughs> right. Right. So. Yeah. 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 And so when, you know, as we take this, like, as you're taking this approach and really like working with your own psyche and your emotions and people and, and business, and what are your thoughts on, on what uh, constitutes a healthy financial foundation? So do you mean like how much money they should have or just sort of the foundation to kind of get going? You know, it could be both, but let's talk about like how, how you set that foundation to, to have, you know, that, that healthy financial foundation. Cause really it, from that perspective, it's like, where do we start and what should we focus on to begin with? Yeah. So this is a good question because it kind of ties into sort of how my business started and where it is now, because when I first started learning about money, I, w I was truly only focused on the how-to aspect, like how do I invest? You know, what's a 401k? How do I invest in that? What's a stock? What's a stock? Like, how do I do that? You know, how do I buy them? So I was really focused on the actions I had to take to create wealth. So like, you know, reading books, that kind of stuff. But then as I hired a coach and, you know, worked with one, I realized that's important, but what's more important is what I think, what I believe and feel, which then will sort of spin off to whatever actions take because you can be super rich and you know 
to, you know, in the eyes of most people, like let's say you have $10 million in the bank, but you can feel poor and you can be scared of losing that money. And that's just not a good way to live. And so I guess to me, a solid financial foundation, I think most people focus on, oh, read a book on how to do X, Y, Z. That is important, but what's more important, because that's focusing on the how, because people always want, well, how do you do this? How do you go from A, which means like zero to Z, like, you know, wealth. The how is never as important as the, the mindset. And so I think it just all starts with really getting introspective and learning how your brain works. So I, I'm a huge believer in coaching. I still pay and invest a lot of money myself in coaching. So it doesn't have to be expensive. I kind of feel like coaching and self-development is like the gym. Like you can pay for a one-on-one trader, which is obviously going to be the most expensive version, but there's plenty of free versions out there or lower cost, like group fit. It was like the orders orange theory versions, right? And so I think you have to get that straight before you can really attempt because if you don't, if you have like a scarcity mindset and you're doing all the things, you're never going to feel good about money. You'll be a multimillionaire and be scared of losing all your money and, you know, yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's a great, that's a great way to start, right? Start within before you know, building you know, on the outside, which is very much, you know, what, what we're doing with, with any kind of wealth building and money, it's external, but I love how you really are talking about building an internal foundation first. And then that's actually, to me, I see that as what goes on the outside and starts building the external foundation of wealth. And I'll just give you a quick example is because I would say, I think people assume I don't know for sure, but I think people assume that I must have a lot of money because I don't have a traditional job and we were in Hawaii and it looks like, you know, on the outside that we have all these nice things, but we do have nice things. Don't get me wrong. But I, we are, I am deaf. We are definitely making less money than when I was working full time as a dermatologist. And what I've noticed is the only thing that's really changed, obviously like the numbers are up and down, but what's, what's truly changed is how I literally decided I'm not, I don't need to stay in this full-time job to live, to have the life I want. A lot of us feel like, well, I can't cut down to part-time or I can't travel and take three months off to travel like we've done until I have a certain amount of money. That's literally just a belief. And I just one day was like, well, that's just, I just realized that wasn't true. And so I think literally it's, I'm not sure, sure I'm explaining it very well, but I just decided like, I don't need a certain number in the bank account to start you know, traveling for months at a time or creating an online business or yeah. et cetera. Because I'll, truthfully with this pandemic going on right now, like I don't have a steady physician job, you know, business is not, I wouldn't say, I would say it's unstable and I don't have like a paycheck coming in every month that I can, you know, be, look forward to. And so in some ways I feel like financially we're actually less stable now, but it doesn't feel that way internally. Like I'm not worried about my ability to pay rent or anything like that, even though technically I don't know when the next paycheck's coming, which yeah. is kind of strange if you think about it, right? Because if I told you or like, you know, a random person said, yeah, I don't really have a job right now and I don't know when the next paycheck's coming, like you would think that person would be really stressed out, but right. I'm not. So right. I find that interesting. That's amazing. That's just a testament to everything that you've been talking about, which, you know, from from your beliefs to making decisions and overcoming false fears and very much that that concept of really what you've described uh, perfectly is live for today instead of this this living in like this perpetual state of when I have this then that you're you're totally taking that off the table and saying I have this therefore this instead of, you know, when I have this and I can do that and then I'll feel this, that, and the other thing. So I think it really speaks to living for today, having an, an inherent internal sense of wealth that, you know, probably brings you so much more joy than when you did have a steady job and, and believe that that was the only thing you needed to feel safe. So I think it's a huge testament to, you know, an example of, of what you do and you're living it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much um, for coming on the podcast and having this conversation. It was, it's really fun to talk about all these things. We did an episode a few episodes ago with Ryan, who's a financial advisor. And he also, we talked a little bit about mindset and about the ego. And so um, we love having these conversations because they're really important to help people get themselves straight before they, you know, before they go out and, and try to do something that, you know, that could go well, but, you know, 
it's, it's really, what am I trying to say? I'm just trying to say that I really appreciate the approach of going inside and then building outside. And it's been such a pleasure to have you on the podcast and sharing all this wisdom and, and your experience with us today. Well, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for tuning in to Real Wealth, Real Health. We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode and 